This is the Grind It Podcast. We know just like grinding a handrail or across the coping can be challenging at times, so can life be. We share God's word and personal stories to encourage you to keep grinding and to not give up. It's time to grind. So here's the old school skateboarder himself, Randall Tucker. If, if we were alive back then and you have the tabernacle, right, and you could see the tabernacle, you could see the tent part and you could see the fence, but you couldn't see, you couldn't get to God. You, you were limited. You, mm-hmm. got, you had to stop at the mm-hmm. altar of sacrifice mm-hmm. and then the priest took over. But then when that glory, uh, when the glory of the Lord came down or when the God came down in the form of that cloud, everybody could see it. Mm-hmm. Everybody saw the presence of God. And then when the veil was torn in two at Jesus' death, mm-hmm. right? That it's ripped in two from top to bottom, saying that God made the way, not man, right. not from the bottom to the top, but God made the way for us to come into his presence. He rent the veil right. in two so that we could come before him. So boldly, right, the scripture says we could come before his presence without guilt or shame or condemnation we can come before him and and find help in our times of need right we have direct access to the throne now and it's not through um the blood of bulls and goats but it's through the the scripture says that there is one mediator between man and God, and that is the man Christ Christ. Jesus. And so he is our mediator. He is our, the one that goes between us and the father. And now because his blood covers us, we can come boldly into the throne room and have direct access, limitless access to the father of glory. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like what Paul's saying. It's Jesus. 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 <laughs> Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus. Because he says in Hebrews, the Hebrew author says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, he says, um, God has spoken to us through his dear son, mm-hmm. right? And then John says in 1.14 that he tabernacled among us. He mm-hmm. dwelt among us. And so you got God's glory coming down the form of a cloud. Now you've got God himself coming down and putting on flesh. It's, mm-hmm. it's crazy mm-hmm. to think about. It's really awesome. And and so there's, the song says, show us your glory. Uh, let every burning heart be holy ground. And it, it is when when we're filled with Jesus, right? And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And God lives inside of us. Our hearts are literally holy ground. Take your shoes off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, and then it says, here and not by might, or I'm sorry, here and not by power, not by might, but only by the cross we come alive. Mm-hmm. This is why I said this song goes really well with Ephesians too, mm-hmm. because what was Paul saying? You know, we're made in alive Christ. in Christ. Christ. In Christ. And what does Jesus say? If you, if, you know, if you want to um, follow me, you got to die. Sacrifice means death, right? Separation. But only by the cross. When we die to ourselves, we come alive. What does Paul say? We come alive in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. The power of his resurrection, right? That lives in us. So only by the cross we come alive. And here we're undone, overcome by heaven's love revealed before our eyes. Jesus, right? That's what we just covered at. So here's what's ironic. So when we die, as we die to ourselves and turn to Jesus, we find life. We find life. Luke 9, 23 and 25, this is what I was mentioning just a few minutes ago. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life uh, for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? In other words, Jesus is saying, like Paul saying in Ephesians 2, you can gratify the flesh all you want, all those desires. But you're you're dead. You're separated from me. And if you die that way, you'll be that way for eternity. And Jesus is saying, but if you want to live, pick up your cross. And we know what happened on the cross. A lot of, a lot of pain and torture and death. Mm-hmm. Right? Humiliation. Uh, it just really just goes against everything that, that you know, the standards that we think uh, I don't really know how else to word that. It goes against what 
what we think life is. Because a lot of people think life's having a bunch of stuff or being really gifted in sports or what you know, whatever. You know, having nice boats and nice cars. Um, that's life. That's living. Uh, what's that song say? Oh, it's got to be the good life. Good life. So going back to this other song, Holy Grail, bridge, the bridge part of it says, chains fall, fear bow, here now, Jesus, you change everything. Lives healed, hope found, here now, Jesus, you change everything. And that pretty much sums up Ephesians chapter two, because Jesus literally changes everything. Mm -hmm. And Paul made a perfect example. Um, Romans chapter 8 is a real good chapter uh, especially verses 1 through 17 it talks about the life that Jesus gives in, in living in the flesh but um, I want us to finish up chapter 2 since we've already covered chapter 2 uh, in, in what we, pretty much what we just talked about in the first 7 verses um, but people can do that on their own time but Romans 8 Romans and Ephesians are really close together as far as theologies to like the things that Paul's talking about. I think Ephesians is a mini version of Romans because they're both very rich in what they talk about. All right, Shelby, if you will read uh, 11 through 13. Okay. Romans 11 through 13. He's going to talk about the Gentiles. And therefore, remember that formerly you who are called Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at the time you were separate, sorry. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, so give you a little history lesson here. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, right? Correct. Okay. The Jews, or God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. Right. With, he said, you're going to be a father of many nations and be the Jews. And circumcision was this covenant. It was the sign of the covenant. Mm -hmm. And God said, if you choose not to be circumcised, then I don't have any part of you and you don't have any part of me. You, 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 I'm rejecting you, right? And he said, this will be an everlasting covenant. Now, we know from Colossians 2 that now is a circumcision of the heart mm -hmm. made by Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Made through Jesus. Gentiles, there were some exceptions. There were some Gentiles that came into the Jewish faith and Judaism mm -hmm. and, and, and did this, few and far between. But for the most part, Gentiles were, they were left out of the covenant mm -hmm. for thousands of years, right? And, and that's what Paul's saying here. Don't forget that you Gentiles, you, you used to be outsiders and you were called uncircumcised heathens. The Jews mm -hmm. and Gentiles did not get along, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he says in those days you were living apart from Christ and you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made them and you lived in this world without God and without hope why because they weren't part of the covenant mm -hmm. they didn't have any, they didn't have, they were living outside of God because God was no for the Jews no God. yeah no relationship but listen to what he says. You were without God, and since you were without God, you didn't have any hope. Mm -hmm. You had nothing. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. This this why this is why Jesus is. I mean, he's it's just so important to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we don't in our culture today we don't think about this. You know. Um, but this is huge, especially the, the people that Paul's writing to, because uh, the, the Jews uh, and the Gentiles, and the, now they're worshiping together, which was ginormous for that day and time. But he's telling these Gentiles at, at this church at Ephesus, he says, you used to be like this, 
You used to live in your transgressions and sin, separate from God, but you know, but God who's rich in mercy, you know, he's he's made you alive. You were dead in your transgressions and sin. Now he's made you alive in Christ. And he said, Hey, don't forget who you used to be. Okay. And I think there's a reason why he's telling that because um it's humility. Don't forget who you, who you once were, right? But you you were outside of Christ. You were outside of God. You, you had no hope because you were Gentiles. You were outside of the promise, the covenant, without hope. But now you have been made, or sorry, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God because you didn't have hope, you were outside of the covenant. But now you've been brought near to him through what? The blood of Christ. Right. Through the blood of Christ. And that's why I'm saying if people think they're too far gone or they think that God would never forgive them, it, it doesn't matter what you've done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If you come to Christ and you're washed in the blood of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You're made a new creation in Christ. And even if you have come to Christ and you've blew it and you've sinned, you can still repent of that sin. And turn back to God and start walking with God even now and 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 be brought in here to God. I generally will direct people to Hebrews 11, you know, the hall of fame for faith, faith right? Mm -hmm. But most, if not all of those were men and or women who were fallible. And had major issues. Yeah. Yet God choose, chose to use them to demonstrate his goodness, right? To, to demonstrate his grace and his mercy. Whether it was Abraham, whether it was David, whether it was Rahab. I mean, and if you know anything about these people, it was prostitutes and murderers and adulterers and liars. If God is in the habit of using people who are desperately broken yeah, and incredibly wicked in and of themselves. Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus. Of Come Jesus. on. She's a prostitute. And a liar. Right. You know, but, but God is in the habit of using people who will make themselves available regardless of how good or bad they seem on the outside. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's what he's saying here. Remember your former state, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those who have, are called the circumcised. At that time, you had no Messiah. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants embodying God's promise. You were in this world without hope and without God. But now, you who were once far off have been brought near through the shedding of the Messiah's blood. For he himself is our shalom. Mm. He has made us both one and has broken down the mechitza, which divided us by destroying in his own body the enmity occasioned by the Torah with its commands set forth in the form of ordinances. There were, there were dividing walls Right, you mentioned earlier the the tabernacle, and we've been studying this because of what you've been um, pouring into recently. But in in the tabernacle, there were walls of separation, mm -hmm. and and some of those walls were to keep out the foreigners, people who were outside the covenant, people who were Gentiles, who were not part of Israel. Right, right. they were not allowed to come into even the outer courts much less into the, the inner places, right? So there was this wall of separation. There was this wall of distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. But what this is saying is that Jesus is our peace, our shalom, that leaves nothing missing, nothing broken, and brings us together as one, regardless of what has happened in your flesh. Yeah. What does Paul say then as in Galatians 3 when he, he says... Uh... Well, I better look it up just to make sure I get it right. If I go to quote something, I'll butcher it all to pieces. Galatians 3, 26, for you are all 
talking about Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? There's the key, in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ by putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, labor free, male mm -hmm. and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Right, so he's saying the same thing. He has made us both one mm -hmm. and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and destroyed that in his own body. Yeah. The enmity or the, the things that cause the separation. And see, that just to show you the struggle that the Jews had for a long time. So even at, so, in, when the church began in Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. or, or, or go back into one of the disciples, when Jesus handpicked the 12 disciples and he told them to, to, to go to the lost sheep of Israel, right? And and so this that's the way it was for a long time. And then the church starts in Acts chapter two, and the Holy Spirit falls. And I think it's either Acts chapter ten or Acts chapter eleven. It, it, I think it's at the end of Acts chapter ten when um, the Holy Spirit falls when Peter's preaching to the, uh, Cornelius and his family and his mm -hmm. friends there in his home, and they start speaking in tongues. And Peter says, "Well, what's keeping us from baptizing these Gentiles now? Right? Because they're all speaking in tongues like we did in Acts chapter two, right? Mm -hmm. And so they baptize them." I think it's the end of Acts chapter 10, after all that goes on. It says that the church was scattered because of persecution, but they went preaching to the Jews only. Mm -hmm. So even, even after the Gentiles had been welcomed, for even for a little while longer, they they just preached to the Jews only because that, that for the longest time, that's the way it was. Right. Well, that was part of Jesus' directive, right? I was reading today in um, Acts. And what does he say? Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So his initial directive was go to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Go to the people of Israel first. Uh, go to Jerusalem, Judea, or all of Yehuda, Judah, right? And then Samaria, the people that are half Jew and half Gentile. Yeah. And then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then go to the nations of the world that have no clue about this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. And so the point I was going to make was a lot of people think that, you know, the Jews rejected their Messiah, Jesus. Therefore, he turns to the Gentiles. But that's not, that's not the way it was at all. The Gentiles were always a part of God's plan. Jesus said in John 10, 16, when he was talking about being sheep, not of this fold. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And he says, I got to bring them also. They listen. They will listen to my voice and there'll be one flock with one shepherd. Mm -hmm. And we just read in Galatians 3, one flock and he's the one shepherd. In Ephesians 2, right? Mm -hmm. you, you were created in union with himself from the two groups a new single humanity and thus make shalom or peace. And in order to reconcile to God, both in a single body by being executed on the stake as a criminal and thus in himself killing that enmity. So in Christ, the, in, the animosity between Jew and Gentile is put to death. Yeah. Acts 11, 19 through 21 is the verses I was trying to think of a while ago. When it talked about the believers being scattered mm -hmm. because of the persecution. And they went and preached only to the Jews. But it says, however, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. And that's the church, that mm -hmm. Gentile church that started there in, in Antioch. It, it outgrew the church in Jerusalem from what I learned in Bible college. So it, it grew and grew and grew. And, and that's what just dumbfounds me, though, because like I've told you the night in, in studying for some things, um, Paul's here, here in Ephesus and he went all, all through Asia and that, and that parts of the world. Right. Which is like modern day Turkey. Yeah. Right. And, and now there's there's no churches there and, and there's very few Christians there. It's, it's like almost all Muslim. And it's like we flip flop now. It's like Gentile churches everywhere, and, and very few Jew. I mean, they, um, I think that what I looked up was there's like 
around 300 or a little over 300 um what, what do you call them the the, the jewish um, that believes that jesus is messiah messianic yeah the messianic jews but it says that most of those churches if you want to call them churches whatever you call those things they're they're filled up with gentiles very few jews even at that so it's just, it's just weird how it's flip-flopped because the church at Ephesus that Paul was talking to is completely gone. It was already waning. That's why Jesus gave them that rebuke in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Book of Revelation. He said, you lost your first love. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, and, and Paul, Paul is, he's talking about how it's all about Jesus, right? Jesus has mm -hmm. taken care of everything. Um, for God has through Jesus. He's, he's given given Jesus through his grace and his uh, uh, rich mercy. And now he's brought Gentiles near to him by the blood of Jesus. Um, Shabby, if you will, read 14 through 16. Is that the end of the chapter? No, there's more to it. Okay. For he, for he himself is our peace. What? 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 He himself is our peace. All right. So if we don't, if, if Christ himself, had, well, the New Living Translation says Christ himself has brought peace to us. Something that did not exist between Jew and Gentile. <laughs> um, so think about this. He says Jesus is life. And now he says Jesus is peace. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know, uh, the Bible also says that he's the Prince of Peace. And Celtic worship has a beautiful song about that, by the way. Prince of Peace. Mm. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It's great. So can we say then, if we don't have Jesus, we don't have life, nor do we have peace. Yeah. Because Jesus is peace, right? Start over, verse 14. Sorry. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, it has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. All right, think about this for a minute. I don't have this in my notes, so I'm going to go off of here. One of the, the main messages in these verses, uh, 14 through 16, is what? Peace. Mm -hmm. Shalom. Shalom. Jesus Shalom. is our peace. And he talks about uniting Jews and Gentiles into one, right? Through what he done on the cross. And he broke down this wall of hostility that separated us. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Think about the man who is writing this and what mm -hmm. happened to him. Every city he went to, pretty much, he got persecuted. He, sometimes he would get beat. Sometimes he'd get flogged. St he stoned stone. and kicked out. He's getting chased from city to city, literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, you remember they, they couldn't find, uh, I can't remember which city he was in at the time, but he, he, you might can remember. But they go in the house of Jason because Paul was supposed to be staying there. Paul wasn't there. So they grabbed Jason and, you know, and take him to put him on trial. And he had to pay a big hefty fine at the court. Mm -hmm. And here's Paul saying, this hostility between Jew and Gentile has been made peaceful now through Jesus. Well, there's a there's a problem somewhere. <laughs> there's a, a major disconnect. Somebody didn't get that <laughs> memo. Somebody didn't, somebody didn't get the memo. But think about who didn't get the memo. The Jews. Where did when Paul went to a city? Where's the first place he went? Synagogue. Synagogue. The Jewish synagogues where he had a captive audience. Some listened, but the majority of them didn't listen. And that's when they, it, they just throw up a hornet's nest. And then those hornets would get to chase him and, mm -hmm. and, and persecute him. But yet here he is saying, God broke this 
this wall of hostility down. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the issue? Those Jews rejected Jesus. They, they, they thought it was blasphemous to even speak his name, right? And, and they, they, they missed the mark, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they did not understand that life only comes through Jesus. They didn't understand that peace only comes through true, real peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding, as he says in Philippians, right? Mm -hmm. Comes through Jesus. But yet here he is writing to the church at Ephesus, even though all this persecution that he's been going through. And he says, hey, God's tore down this wall of hostility. Now Jew and Gentiles are now worshiping together. And, and we see that here. He's, you, you, and that's God's goal is unity, right? Right. And in our day and time, we would say it's the black church and the white church, or black Christians and the white Christians, or however you want to say that. Um, unfortunately, in the South, we're still separate. We see, there are churches that's come together, and mm -hmm. you know, with different races and nationalities. It's great to see, right? and we're all one. Um, Our very own Mary Gamboa Tucker from the Grind It Podcast has been a worship leader for over twenty years, and she is currently the worship leader at Authentic Church at three twenty two Lindsay Street in Alcoa, Tennessee. If you'd like to worship with her and Randy and Shelby as they all play on the worship team. You can come and meet them there at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Mary produced and released her new album called Jealous, and you can check it out at marygamboamusic.com. That's M-A-R-Y-G-A-M-B-O-A-M-U-S-I-C.com or any app where you listen to your music. If you would like to have Mary lead worship your next event, you can contact her here at The Grind It Podcast, her website, or text her at 865 418 now back to the podcast. It was very difficult for even for Jews back then to worship with the Gentiles. And, and that's what Paul's aiming at here, to, to focus on Jesus. And he's broken down this wall of hostility. He's given us peace by creating in himself one new people from the two groups together as one body. Christ reconciled both groups to God by the means of his death on the cross and hostility toward each other was put to death. Yeah. It's gone. What did God tell the people in the Old Testament when they were going in to conquer a, a pagan man? What would he tell them every time? Kill everybody. Right? Kill all the people and don't don't grab any of their stuff. Leave, leave their stuff behind. Don't take anything. And he also would command them, don't marry the mm -hmm. people. Right. Right. Wow, because he 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 knew what what kind of trouble that would cause if if they because I think one of one of the main reasons why God would tell the people that his Jew the Jews the people that's under the covenant his covenant if they intermingle with the people and they start inter, uh, marrying the people how, what's, I don't know what the correct term mm -hmm. for that is. Then they would start following their gods, mm -hmm. their false gods, which is exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, we see that all throughout the Old Testament. Right. You see that with Solomon and all of his wives, even the wisest man who ever lived. Mm -hmm. Yet he didn't stay faithful to the Lord. And all of his wives and concubines turned his attention towards other gods. Yeah. The wisest man in history still did not remain faithful to the Lord. And in his older age, he was definitely drawn away and enticed by other gods and or was sacrificing to other gods along with his foreign wives. So you can kind of understand then why the Jews, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying they had their nose in the air, but they are the ones that God made the covenant with. They were, they were, Call God's uh, the apple of His eye, mm -hmm. and, and the Gentiles are on the outside, and the Gentiles have these Baal, Asherah. They have all these false gods that could do nothing, but yet they treated them as if they were real. Right, and we see this even uh, 
when Paul walks through Athens, right? Right. And they got all these different gods. They had a god for everything under the sun, including the sun, right? True. Because, like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. But uh, the uh, the plagues were against the the plagues were like mocking or mimicking the the all Egyptian, the Egyptian gods. gods. Yeah, the yeah. false gods that didn't exist, mm -hmm. right? So you got thousands of years of history there between the Jew and Gentile. The Jews think say, "Hey, we're God's chosen," and the Gentiles being left out, and now. All of a sudden, they're brought together as one. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. But what 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 is the um, what is the uh, unifying factor between the Jew and Gentile? It's Christ Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. It's that we are all desperate and wicked and in need of a savior. Yeah. yeah. But just to show you the. the um, the struggle between the two. What happens with between Paul and Peter in Galatians 2, 11 through 21? You remember that? When Paul says, I had to get in Peter's face because Peter was uh, eating with the Gentiles. Way. Yeah, he's acting one way. And then when the Jews come in, he gets up from the Gentiles and goes over with the Jews. So, I mean, and this is a man who's a pillar of the faith, right? right. Been there from the beginning. Full of the Holy Spirit and boldness in Acts 2. But yet here he is bringing that wall of separation back up. Being corrected. Yeah, Paul says, I got his face. Tell him that he was wrong for doing that. All right, Shelby, look at 3 verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And that, that's really attractive. Again, he brought this good news of peace to you, <laughs> to you Gentiles who were far away because you're outside of the covenant. But now peace to uh, there's peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us, everyone, Jew and Gentile, we can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done mm -hmm. for us. Um, Look at verse 19. Uh, read verses 19 through 22. Is that the end of the chapter? Yeah, I think yes. so. Okay. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation. You, yeah, they had to put a smile on their face, you know what? For the Gentiles. <laughs> you're no longer strangers and foreigners. You're not. You're no longer on the outside looking in. You're, you're not the... That those widows that were, Come in. yeah, that needed to, you know, they're off to get old. Mm -hmm. oh, you're, you're, you are fellow citizens, so you are, you were considered one with God's people and members of God's family. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Shelby. Sorry. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself Christ as the chief cornerstone. Foundation. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So, Shab, you you you're you're all into building and woodworking and electrical stuff. You know anything about the cornerstone? Yeah. When it comes to building. Do you know anything about the cornerstone? Usually the cornerstone was one of the first stones, I believe, that was laid in the foundation. And and that's where everything else was measured from. Off that cornerstone. Right. Yeah. Everything was built off. That cornerstone was set, and everything was built off that cornerstone. And and he says the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. That Well, let me back up to verse 20. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we are carefully joined together, becoming a holy temple uh, for the Lord. Um, before I started Bible college long ago, I, I literally designed an 1,800 square foot log cabin on a napkin. And I turned it into the log cabin company. I'm going to say log, cab log cabin. And they they uh, made these blueprints of my drawing that I turned in on a napkin. Now they the, they delivered my log cabin package, and along with that package came a set of blueprints. 
real blueprints, not on a napkin, but mm-hmm. the real big old blueprint. You, you've seen blueprints, right? Because you probably have to use blueprints yeah. for the awesome. Yeah. So what? Why have blueprints? What? What's the? Why do you need blueprints? So you know how to build it. Yeah. Properly. Yeah, you got to know how to build it properly. Gives you the pattern. Gives you the pattern. Gives you all the measurements. Yeah, it gives you all the measurements, and and, and you're supposed to. <laughs> To, to to follow those to uh, um, to make the building you know to make the building take shape mm-hmm. like um, I had a measurement for the footers which I dug with a shovel I didn't use a backhoe or anything I dug dug the footings with a shovel poured them full of concrete but it had to be it was a thirty by forty thirty foot by forty foot mm-hmm. had to be that if I'd have made it any bigger my my Floor plan would have been all messed up, right? And then I had to have certain uh, concrete pillars and footings in the middle of those floor joists because all the weight of that log cabin came to a certain point in the house. And so I had to have certain uh, footers in certain places to hold up that the weight of that house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I would have put them anywhere else, it, it it would have been all messed up. And actually, I, I did that. I kind of messed up, and I had to kind of redo some things, and I had to have an engineer come in and say, hey, it, it's okay. You, you, this, will, this will still work together. But it, when I started stacking the logs, the, fortunate for me, the, the log, uh, log cabin company had already cut them to size, and they had numbers on them. So you remember like Lincoln logs? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like what it was doing. It was just a big old Lincoln log structure. But I can look on the plan and the logs are numbered and I would go look for that log and then I would put it in place. But if I would have had to cut that stuff for myself, if it, or, or if the log cabin company would have just cut it, the logs to any old length, then my windows, if, if I didn't cut it to the exact measurements or whatever it would the windows wouldn't fit the doors wouldn't fit mm-hmm. or and, and and that's the idea here that, that paul says that the uh that, that what god has done for the church and how everything now through christ everything is joined together mm-hmm. perfect right through uh through him, through Jesus, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. We're carefully joined together in Jesus, becoming a holy temple for um the Lord. So you think about this picture that Paul gives here in Ephesians 2. The church is made up of different people with different talents, and even though they 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 look like they wouldn't fit like me with all the tattoos and my weirdness, right? When we look at people, we're like, how can God ever use them? But look at, the, like you said, well, look at the people that he's used. Look at the people that he used to uh, to get his message with the 12 disciples, original. Even though the people, they look like they wouldn't fit in, they do fit in because he gives us all different talents and abilities. And that's why he's talking about it in First Corinthians 12 and how he takes us as individuals and uses us. But yet as individuals, we come together, Jew and Gentile alike, right? It's all to glorify Christ. Right. And, and like you said at the beginning, um, I believe it was in chapter one, we were talking about in him, in him, in Christ, in mm-hmm. him, in him, in Christ. And that's exactly what it's saying here. In union with him, the whole building. Um, it's growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built. You know, it's it's nothing of ourselves. It's not, nothing that we can say that we have done. It's no merit of our own, but only when we are in union with him, that we are being built together to become a holy temple to the Lord with him. Right, we are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. All right. So before you pray, I want to I want to end with this. That's what I got written in my notes here. Everybody, every single person has a place in the church. 
including you who's listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. From the one who hated Christians, putting them in jail, Paul, mm -hmm. who's writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, he gave consent to their murder to the tattooed freaks like me, who is full of weirdness. He even said today, Who's this man I married? <laughs> you were joking. To black people, yellow people, white people, red people. What's the song say? Yellow, black and white. They're precious in the sight. Young people, old people, men and women, drug users, alcoholics, liars, prostitutes, gays, lesbians. Jesus changes everything. And when Jesus gives life, he makes it all fit into his house that he is building. So the question is, are you a part of it? Can you raise out? Sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word that shows us who we are and how desperately we need you. Lord, we can do nothing apart from you. But I thank you that in you and in union with you, through you, we can do all things. Thank you that you are building us together to be a dwelling place for you. And we want to be holy and pleasing, acceptable in your sight. And Lord, it's not because of anything that we've done, but, but because of all that you have done. Thank you that you've washed us whiter than snow. You've, you've taken away our past and nailed it to the cross. And, and that you've considered us brand new in Christ Jesus. And thank you that you've destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Now there is, therefore, no longer any, any Jew or Gentile, slave or free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. Help us to look at each other that way. Even across denominational lines or cultural barriers, help us to look at each other and see Christ being formed in us and through us. We ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Keep grinding. Thanks for listening to the Ground It Podcast. If we could pray for you or encourage you in any way, please email us at thegrounditpodcast at gmail.com or you can text us at 865-418-2824. If you're watching on YouTube, please click like and subscribe and you'll be notified about new episodes. If you're listening on an app, leave us a five-star review, but most importantly, share the Grounded Podcast with a friend. God bless you and remember, keep grinding.